We are back and thanks for tuning in. It is season two of Crest Podcast in partnership with Elusive. We've got a great guest to kick off today. We've just got off the uh, line to somebody from Indonesia. Uh, I think uh, we we're all feeling pretty envious of uh, Luke Cromwell's setup. Amazing stories to hear. Uh, and uh, it's just the start of a wonderful season full of incredible and inspiring tales from Wales and beyond. Let's get on with it. Enjoy the show, guys. Yes, we're back for a second season, and who'd have thunk it? And to kick off, could there be a better guest and a finer set of surf tales to make us all grow? Luke Cromwell, aka Photo Boss Bali, if you've admired his output on Instagram, is joining us from his mansion in Nusa Dua. If you don't want to hear about perfect waves, once in a lifetime, empty lineups, and a career of Indo boat trips, well, I'm sure Joe Rogan has someone less interesting for you to turn to. On this channel, though, it's the one and only Luke Cromwell. Well, welcome to the show, Luke. Uh, great to be on, boys. Thanks for having me. Great to chat to you, boys. Absolute pleasure. And so through this crisp video link, Luke can see the presenters staring out at him. But for the benefit of the listeners, we should introduce the Crest team by name. To my left, a man who is so averse to excitement, so hostile to action, loathe to entertainment, that he actually buys tickets to London's annual NFL fixtures and goes... It's Tom Anderson. How are you, Tom? <laughs> Very well, thanks, Rob. I'm uh, I'm quite flattered by that. Uh, and to my right, uh, it's the sensei of the new craze in online learning: kung fu punctuation. Wax on, wax off, comma in, colon out. It's Rob Webster Blythe. Yeah, I like that too. Cheers. Thank you. Nice to be here. Okay, Luke. Just uh, by way of introduction to you, I know that you listened to the the show last year. But each episode, Tom and I um, gave each other a little, a little introduction. They, they became more and more elaborate as the as the season progressed. But we um, we ended up as a as a draw last year because after each episode, we asked the, each show's guest to pick a winner. Can you uh, can you take on that responsibility again, please? Oh, Who's won? Mine tough or Tom's? one, classic. That's what they all say. Well, sorry, Rob, but I think I'm going to have to give it to Tom for the start of the year, mate. That was, oh, uh, that was gold. Okay. <laughs> result, I don't know, though, whether I cheated because um, mine is actually true. Well, no, mind you, Rob's was true as well, actually. So, uh, yeah, we'll have, to, we'll have to... I didn't really buy into mine, though. <laughs> I, I didn't believe it because, as you know, I, I enjoy watching pretty much any sport. And I, I can, if times are tough and there's not much on. I can force myself to watch NFL as well. So I didn't really buy into it. I think it was the selling. Oh, fair enough. Uh, oh, that Kung Fu punctuation video of yours, Rob, that is fabulous stuff. Um, by the way, highly I'm recommended for all our listeners. So after a few moments of housekeeping, we're going to take a punt at telling you all a little more about Luke too, by way of introduction. But before we do, can we take the opportunity to thank each and every listener who tuned in to a season one episode, and especially those who were kind enough to fill out our survey monkey, which has helped producer Dodd get some invaluable feedback for the planning of this second season. What can you expect this year? Well, more of the same type of interviews and topical debates, as well as a few more figures from outside of Wales as well. Our big news this spring is that this podcast is now being brought to you in partnership with Elusive, the Wales-based environmentally conscious apparel and lifestyle brand. We share their goals of sustainability and authenticity and it's a partnership the Crest team is very excited about. Keep an eye out for promos and other related stuff as the season progresses. Following your feedback and heavy negotiations with a few mates, there will also be more of the filmed episodes, we hope. The plan for this year is to go fortnightly across the rest of the spring and summer and, all being well, to finish off with a mid-autumn double episode life story of one of this land's most celebrated surf characters. Be here for another Christmas special and then a round-the-world trip with the take-ins. Once Spotify have cancelled Joe Rogan to fund our seven-figure deal, of course. That's the plan, at least. How closely we actually get to that plan? Well, uh, stay subscribed and you'll get to find out. And for the season debut, what a fine place to start. What can we say about Luke Cromwell? Well, from humble beginnings as an up-and-coming ripper in Pembrokeshire, this stylish goofy foot quickly found an appetite for travel. 
contest wins and sponsors as standard. He may have been fast, loose and dangerous in the junk beach breaks of Wales, but Luke soon cultivated a reputation as someone who could really put it on rail in the better stuff too. No wonder he has formed such a bond with the steep drops, open tubes and screaming walls of Indonesia's many fabled point breaks and reef passes. So much so that he is now from Wales, but of Indonesia. Yes, you heard me right. The nation with the best waves on earth is currently the place Luke calls home. What a thing to be able to say. And in 2020, of all years, we all know the challenges the world faced last year, a lot of which is still ongoing. Hard times for many. But one thing the entire global surfing community was captivated by last year was the situation in Indonesia. No crowds. Travel banned. Like morning of the earth, apparently, all over again. It was almost purifying for the soul to see it, and an unbearably tantalising prospect for those of us who had no chance of being there. But Luke was there the whole time. As I'm sure he's going to tell us, there's some truth in the legends of Indonesia 2020 and some fiction. Yes, in the coming hour, we're going to hear what it's like to hit some of those waves as if they were being discovered all over again. And we'll get the gen on those sessions at Padang Padang and elsewhere on Bali with Kelly Slater, who chose Luke's backyard as his chosen spot to see out the middle of that weirdest of years. Uh, maybe we'll start there, actually. Um, Luke, uh, I saw a pic you uploaded of Slater surfing Padang Padang. Does he, does he surf the place well? Was he a standout? Because a lot of the locals have got it super wired, haven't they? Uh, yeah, the standard there is unbelievable, Tom. You know, the Slater, did, did he did put in a good performance, but uh, everyone out there was getting good waves. And I, Tom said he saw that photo that you had of, of Slater at Padang Padang. And we were, we were all kind of living our life through Kelly Slater's Instagram, oh, and yours, actually. Basically, anybody that yeah. was in, in somewhere warm with good waves uh, during our first lockdown. And it, it, well, kind of words can't describe the jealousy that I felt at, at seeing some of your pictures, Luke. Um, Slater's infamous session, I think it was, there was one particular day where it was, it was pretty solid padang. But aside from that, did you get to, to shoot him much? Because according to his Instagram, he was, uh, he was pretty prolific. He was all over the shop, wasn't he? Yeah, it was actually it's quite funny, the, the story behind that. Um, just as he arrived in Bali, you know, it was all over social media and Harry tagged me in a post saying, oh, you need to hook up with uh, Luke to try and get some shots. Um, I saw that. Which, which I was laughing. And then the very next day, I mean, it was perfect forecast for Padang Padang. So I was, yeah, it was, it was the obvious choice, you know. No one knew where he was going to be surfing, but I thought I'd go and have a look. Um, but that morning I got down there, there was, it's one of the busiest days I've ever seen at Padang. It was like everyone was there. I think everyone was there to try and, you know, get that shot of Slater and all the local boys were there. So it was, it was, it was busy. I counted, I think it was 12 water photographers in the water. So I ended up actually staying up on the cliff and trying to get some different angle shots and managed to snap a, snap a shot of him in a stand up. So I posted it later that day and then he shared it. So I was stoked with that. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, your brother's like a fixer in the international surf world, <laughs> isn't he? Hooking up photographer <laughs> and, and surfer alike. So, you said it was one of the busiest days you've ever seen at Padang. Presumably, that same day, there must have been loads of empty spots just absolutely firing, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, Uluwatu, would, there was only a handful of guys out. It was massive. Um, but this whole period, Bali, um, Bali's actually been quite crowded, whereas if you want to get away from the crowds going out of Bali, you know, that's where you really score the, the, the uncrowded waves. Yeah. Bali, I mean, there's so many, think, there's a lot of good locals and there's a big expat community here, you know? Um, yeah, of course. You, you you still manage to get the odd session. I mean, the few times I've been to Bali, it, the crowds, uh, your main spots always, I mean, they're unavoidable, but you always seem to luck into one or two sessions in, in a week or two weeks on Bali. Quiet, really good waves. It still it still happens, doesn't it? Yeah, for sure. My brother was here just before um, just before the COVID struck, you know, and uh, I think he spoke about it on on the podcast he did with you. We we had a lot of good waves. Uh, we were kind of chasing different different spots, you know, and you'll still get your moments. But even during the pa pandemic, you know, I got some really good photographs of Bing in and Padang Padang, you know, early in the morning with no one out. So there was definitely moments yeah. to to score. Brilliant. You know, then prime waves what? with no one around. Absolutely. And you say you say prime waves, Luke. 
what are your favorite spots on in Bali to surf and to, to photograph? It's a funny one, Rob. Any you can name? <laughs> I, I don't actually surf that much when I'm in Bali, believe it or not, because I'm always busy with it with the photography. But um yeah, when whenever I'm chasing waves, there's there's a lot of good beach breaks, you know, that people don't and they're not not so much secret spots, but they're kind of off the radar, you know. So mm-hmm. I'll I'll target them beach breaks all the time. I love love surfing beach breaks. Um I don't know. I don't know if you've surfed something where I compare at home, somewhere like Tanby South Beach, where you've just got A-frame barrels. There's a lot of good beach breaks like that that kind of go off, go unridden, you know. Um, people always so target them famous spots like Padang and Bingin, Oluwatu, but there's a lot of other good ways to, to be surfed. My, uh, my first ever time in Bali, I um, my best wave of the trip was a, a right-hander at a beach break, believe it or not. Yeah, Land okay. Perfect where was left that, reach passes. Um, oh, I can't even remember. I yeah. just a random beach. And uh, yeah, turned up and again, no one in, bit overhead. But in, again, in the land of perfect lefts, I got a right beach break. Yeah, wow. <laughs> Classic. <clears throat> exactly the same thing happened to me, actually, in my first ever trip there. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'd been scrapping away out on the bucket and then uh, you'll laugh. I was just surfing halfway Kuta the day before getting the flight. <laughs> and uh, it was it was a little bit big for the for the beach to properly be working and I got stuck in a bit of a rip and then I suddenly found myself taking off on a right that was kind of like going into that kind of bendy bit of the bay and uh, it just turned inside out and it was my best wave of the whole trip. Yeah, yeah. wow. Yeah, I've had some good waves in Kuta. It's, when the banks are right, it can be can be world class. Yeah, and the surfers in Kuta and the standard of surfing is absolutely incredible. Balinese surfers, um, been been lucky enough to to have spent a little bit of time with a few of them, um, like uh, Blackie as they call him, or Agus uh, Setuan, um, Sandy Slamet and his brother um, Mono, or, or they call him Ende Supriana, isn't it? And I know you know quite a few of these guys. I know I know the guys through the um, the surf camp that Andrew runs in Padang Padang. You know Abra and Andrew. Um, who who do you really rate out of the Balinese surfers, Luke? And and which ones are you friendly with and get on well with? Ah, oh, they. There's so many good surfers, Tom. It's funny you mentioned them, boys. I was I've been with them today. Uh, we met at Karamas this morning. Met up with Sandy and Blackie, and yeah, I, uh, I shot them at Karamas this morning. Um, the waves were only small, but we got some shots, so yeah. boys will be happy. But um, I don't tend to hang out with them, boys. That they uh, they're more based at Ulus and whatnot. Yeah. Uh, one of the guys I work with a lot is a guy called Tonjo. Uh, him and his twin brother Blair Ronk. I, sh- I shoot them a lot. They're from they're from Padma. Uh, they're oh, they're yeah, a really yeah. high standard. Yeah, there's the the Padma boys are a little bit of a a, a gang of uh, of rippers, aren't they? Um, cause, cause yeah, they. I, I think it was. They've Sandy, got a crew actually, of who, really good boys. Yeah, I think it was Sandy actually who took Breach and me there one one morning for a little surf, and uh, I couldn't really believe it. We were like having coconuts with them and all stuff like that, and they were super sound, lovely. But then I think they can be a bit a bit intimidating if you try and paddle out without knowing any of them, can't they? Yeah, for sure. So Sandy's one of the nicest guys. Uh, I've worked with him years ago, and he's a really, really nice guy. He's got a really good attitude, and he's ripping at the moment, surfing really well. Is he? Here at No Limit Wetsuits, a reputable company with 30 years experience, we use the best neoprene on the planet. Guaranteed perfect fit, full aftercare service should you need it. So whether you're from North Wales, West Wales, Pembroke, Shire, or the rest of the UK, Feel free to call me or check out nolimitwetsuits.co.uk. Greg Owen, Welsh surfing champ, eight times. Why um, do you think that producer Dodd was telling me that, that we've got to try and have this debate and, uh, and, and um, it's one that's been going on for a long time. Why, why do you think Bali is yet to, to springboard someone onto like the, you know, the upper end of the QS or onto the WCT? I don't really know, Tom, but I, I'm sure it's coming, mate. There's there's yeah. a couple of guys now. I don't know if you know about Rio and yeah, Rio some of these younger yeah. guys. Yeah, coming through the ranks, their surfing is just unbelievable, and yeah. I, I'd be surprised if if Rio doesn't make the tour. He, yeah. He's surfing really well. I think Rio, Rio uh, was on the. He, he's there or thereabouts for Olympic qualification as well, isn't he? I think he was just one or two heats away in the in the worlds, and he might get another shot this year, hopefully. Yeah, yeah, he. Um, He's another level, you know. He's he's really really doing well. Amazing, and presumably, Luke. Uh, uh, aside from Bali, I know that you do quite a bit of work on the boats as well, don't you? Yeah, that's. Um, oh, go on, Rob. Sorry. No, I was just, just going to carry on. Um, you do a lot of work on the boats, and you, I imagine, get to see some 
some amazing waves and some uh, amazing surfing on those too, right? Yeah, very lucky, Rob. I've worked on the boat since I've been here and I think I moved to uh, here when I was 2012. And uh, I've worked on the boat since then, spending one month on the boat and then one month in Bali and yeah, been lucky enough to score some some amazing waves. Very, amazing. very lucky. And so, you what, that's nigh on eight, eight, nine years now that you've been you've been there right yeah yeah indeed um and was it your your back obviously we spoke to your brother harry in season one and uh, we know all about his his exploits on the boats and it was it was you that got him into that in the first place wasn't it uh you talking was about the, that, on the that, fishing boats rob yes yeah we uh we spent a good good amount of time working together out of saundersfoot harbour uh that was good good times uh but yeah i got so, harry into the fishing boats and now he ended up skippering a boat for years and now he's just bought his own boat. So I'm so stoked for him. Yeah, it's brilliant, isn't it? And I imagine it was your experience on those that you kind of transferred across to, to life on the boats in India, right? Yeah, for sure. For sure. I learned a lot working on the fishing boats and that was um, that was what, what got me in uh, to, the, to working on the boats out here, my experience I had from back in Wales. And it, it sounds like a, a silly question as I sit here in lockdown point two or is it the third second <laughs> yeah. i don't even know which lockdown we're on now is, i've given up <laughs> it's it's cold outside it's it's just stopped raining and this sounds like a, a ridiculous question but was it a tough decision <laughs> to to stay in bali and in indonesia uh, yeah it, well, it was a tough decision yeah it was because at the time it wasn't you know when we first went into lockdown uh it was it was a no-brainer you know i was 100 percent staying here but then as things went on you know and everyone started leaving and you know people were telling me to come home and you know people saying oh you got to get out of Indo." you know i was starting to have second thoughts then so it was quite yeah. quite a tough decision then you know when we were sort of two three months into the lockdown you know uh, it was it wasn't easy to make the decision to stay here so you moved out to bali uh, or to indonesia because of the contract you had to work on the boat right in the first place yeah that's right tom yeah yeah i actually did my first trip when i was 15 to bali uh, i did a a trip with a British team. And that was right. my first first time abroad surfing. So that was my first introduction to Indonesia. And I, I loved it ever since then, you know. And where where did the um, photography come from then? Because, you you know, you're out there, you're surfing, you're, you're working the boats. And then wh- when was the first time you just suddenly picked up a camera and realised that that was going to go, you know, that was going to become a thing? Yeah. Do you know what, Tom? When I started working on the boats, yeah, I'd never, never taken a photograph. Um, no way. The, the boss of the boat kind of, you know, said part of the job is, you know, you've got to try and get some uh, some photographs for the guests. And oh, OK, yeah. So that that's where it started. I used to just do a couple of hours every day on the boat, just taking photographs of the boys and then went from there, you know. Yeah. And then you'd get to surf as well, though, in between all of that. Yeah, for sure. I get, get to surf on the boat. At what point did you realise then that, you know, you'd started to learn how to you know, do shutter speeds and, you know, apertures and, you know, you were starting to acquire a bit of a talent for take, <laughs> taking pictures. I'm still learning that now, Tom. <laughs> it's very humble of yeah, you. No, it's it's one of them things, you know, you, you learn something every day and constantly learning. I, I wouldn't, um, you know, you, you're always learning something. Every day you go shoot, you, you learn. it's the same as surfing, you know, you're always, you're looking at guys at a different level and you're trying to, do different styles and you're always playing with that stuff and um living in indonesia then you know where every time i've been i don't know if rob would say the same thing um i i always end up feeling kind of like you know you're, you're sad you're leaving but you're always sort of oh yeah you know you're sitting in that air conditioned departure lounge in, in your jeans and trainers <laughs> and you've had a shower and all that and it's like oh i'm going home to you know to carpets and and, and tv and, and cinemas or whatever um do do you do you get that kind of you know the hardships of living out in Indonesia? Do you know what Tom? I miss home. I miss home loads, mate. Um, I think we're very lucky in Wales. We've got such a good community. I think that's what I miss most. You know, the all the boys and family. Uh, I think yeah, like I said, I think we're very lucky in Wales. Uh, it was a good place to grow up. But it, you're obviously one of these people who, for whom you know the 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 tropics and the. The lifestyle there is like it, it works for you, you know, your you, you, your body and your diet, and you know you, you're happy with it all. Yeah, that one of the reasons I decided uh, to stay here. Um, obviously, I had work here, so I was very lucky with that. Um, but 
back in the UK, I used to get a lot of allergies and, you know, I got quite bad asthma as well. And that used to play, play havoc with me back at home. But out here, it's not a problem, you know, it's mad. Mm. Uh, so that, that was one of the big decisions, just feeling healthy out here, you know, whereas back home, you're always on the asthma pump or got an allergy or something like that, you know, it just uh, feel a lot more comfortable out here. Cool. And and let's um, let's ask a bit about 2020 specifically then. So once you did make that commitment to stay out there, um, I, I you know when we when we spoke on the phone the other day, you know you were saying to me that uh, yeah you know there's the there's the there's the dream propagated by Kelly Slater and by you know the sort of the Instagrammers of what Bali and Indonesia were like in 2020. But you said also you know that, that it was it was a year of hardships for um, Indonesia and everybody living there. Yeah, for sure, Tom. You know, it's uh, it's not all rainbows and butterflies here. You know, it's uh, while the waves are world class. You know, there's there's other problems and other things to deal with. Um, and during this pandemic, a lot of the local businesses, you know, have really struggled. And yeah, a lot of the local guys have had a really really tough time. Uh, so you've got to feel sorry for them. Has it sort of set um, Indonesia back in terms of its it, its march on 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 the world surf scene? Do you think? I don't know. The likes of, I remember when we first went to lockdown, like the, you know, Rio went over to Sambara and he was there just, I think that time he had in Sambara, I think he went up to another level, you know? So I think it's probably, um, like I said, I think you'll see in the upcoming years, surfers will be at that level where they're, you know, they're, they're competing internationally for sure. And you just said that Rio went over to Sambara, uh, Luke, did you manage to get out of, of Bali at all? And, uh, explore some of the the lesser lesser densely populated areas yeah Rob, waves as well i was um i was actually out on a charter when this all when this all kicked off um we did our first charter last year i think it was in the end of february and we did our first trip no worries but there was a lot of talk on the boat about everybody going home early and and whatnot because of what was going on but we managed to finish the first first charter and then the second trip we did, I think it was in mid-March, if, I, if I'm not wrong, they, they came on board and everyone was umming and ahhing about what was going to go on. You know, we were hearing about lockdowns, you know, all over the world and we were a bit worried about what was going to happen. But we decided to go ahead with the trip and uh, we had some really good waves. And halfway through the trip, we, we got back into signal and I think things had got worse and, you know, families were calling and telling telling the guys on the boat, you know, you, you've got to get back to Australia as soon as you can. So unfortunately, the boys on the trip decided that they wanted to call it a day, which was, yeah, that was a tough decision because we were the only ones out there, you know, we, we were the only boat out there in the area that we were in and we were, you know, getting some world-class waves with no one around. So there was definitely mixed mixed feelings on the boat and we, we wow. ended up deciding to, to call it a day and we sailed back to Padang and the, the, the boys flew back to Australia. So, yeah, that was. I bet that was. I bet it was a. It was a tough old call that one. But uh, like you say, we we just didn't know the the direction it was going to take at that point. It was quite frantic. It was. I mean, it was certainly new, and it was. Uh, it was a dynamic situation, wasn't it? It was all. It was ever changing. So yeah, I can imagine the uh, pulling their hair out over that one. Horrendous. Yeah, it was. But, it, um, it was tough, Rob, to leave perfect waves with no one around. You know, and obviously some guys wanted to stay, but the majority made the call that you know they wanted to get back and get back to australia so that was that was fair enough so yeah we we, we I, did that i don't know where, how how true this is but i i read um an article somewhere around that time and i think it was um maybe an australian or american expat that owned one of the um the land camps and w- is it true that there was some kind of policing going on of of, of people surfing and people out on boats there yeah well so after I got back from that trip, things got worse and the mental eyes actually closed and they closed all access to the mental islands with the, so you couldn't go there on a surf charter boat. Uh, all the boats that were out there operating, they were told they had to come back to Padang uh, and the, all the land camps were also t- told that they had to close. So yeah, the mental eyes went into lockdown and there was a lucky few that were stuck out there. And they, they they scored some some really good waves. I was actually trying to get back out there, but but I was advised not to not to go back out there. So I I 
I was looking at options and I ended up going down to South Sumatra, um, which turned out amazing. So I'd never been down there. So that was a that was a good adventure. Is is that Crewy area you're talking about? Yeah, I was actually staying close to Crewy, a wave called Wei Jambu, uh, with a with a Balinese friend called Jocko. We we stayed with him and yeah, we we had some amazing waves down there. That was uh that you've was probably the highlight of the year, being down there for sure. You've got a pair of coconuts if you're surfing Wei Jambu regularly, then Luke, because uh, I I have to say that that one has sent me back to land with my tail between my legs. Yeah, no, and it it did me, Tom. We had some some crazy sessions out there, and I remember a few days. Yeah, it definitely gave me the fear that wave. Uh, it's not not for the faint-hearted, that's for sure. But there's a lot of good waves in that area as well. You know, it's uh. We surfed Mandiri Beach a lot. We, we were hanging with the boys there a lot. And, yeah, we surfed a lot with them. And, yeah, we had some amazing waves there. But uh, yeah, even it? though the waves were the waves were unbelievable, I couldn't have asked for more. It was, there was a really bad vibe down there, you know. And really? I, I stand out like a sore thumb with my, with my pale skin. And, uh, you know, the, there was a yeah, really bad vibe to, to the Westerners there. So, you know, it wasn't. But the sense that it was not a time for, for leisure and indulgence and that then? Well, that's, they, no one really know, knew what was going on with this COVID. And at, at the time, anyone with white skin in Indo, they, they thought that, you know, maybe we were bringing it into the country. So, hmm. you know, we, we had a pretty bad reception. And, yeah, it was um, like I was wearing long sleeves and jeans and just, just to try and hide, you know. It, was, uh, it wow. wasn't, it wasn't wow. I didn't feel comfortable, you know. So we, we've we kind of heard it all here from from perfect waves and uh, the kind of offsetting of your allergies and your asthma in the yeah. nice humid climate, I suppose, yeah. right through to the, the the missing home and the as you just described some some bad vibes during during COVID times. But the, the question on everybody's lips, Luke, is: Are you going to stay for good? What's oh, for sure, Rob. I'm in for the long term, mate. <laughs> I uh, I'd love to spend more time at home, and that's been. Another another tough thing, you know. Um, we had actually planned a trip back to the UK, uh, myself and my partner, and we were we were hoping to come back in in May, but obviously that got put off. We were waiting for that that trip for two years, you know. So when all this kicked off, I I could have come home, but she she wouldn't have been able to. So it was a it was a really mm-hmm. tough decision, you know. I can imagine it's uh, it's, it's certainly the current kind of COVID climate is is difficult for to, for families living kind of on other sides of the world, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, for sure, Rob. That, that was the hardest thing for me, you know, and it, it still is now, you know, just missing family at home it's and the, want to get back and I see everyone. It's, it's the uncertainty as well, isn't it? There's kind of, there's no uh, clear end in sight. There's no clear point at which you can say, oh, I'm going to go home here. I'm going to go home now. Like you said, your flight's been, uh, your trip's been put off for, two, well, two years in, in waiting and now it's been put off again. Yeah, yeah exactly, Rob. It's, it's three years now since I've been home, so dying for a trip back to, to catch up with everyone. And, uh, and how, how much of a tonic is the surf, is the Indonesian surf then? You know, so, so, so when you were there in South Sumatra in the Krui area and you know, you're feeling worried about things and you're saying that the vibe on land is difficult, are there still these moments where um, you, know, you, you, you see those incredible like 18 second periods, you know, grinding Indonesian walls and there's hardly anyone in the water and it kind of makes up for it. Do you find yourself thinking like, yeah, you know, this is, this is why I'm here. Yeah. I, that period I was down in South Sumatra and you know, I saw amazing waves and, you know, I'll never forget them times, uh, but it, yeah, we, it was a tough one, you know, like I had some perfect sessions, but with no one around, you know, and for surfing for me is getting good waves with your mates, you know, and yeah, <laughs> I don't know, some, some of the sessions, like just being out there just with these, crazy waves just you know getting good barrels but it's it's good but it's not the same if you're not with all the boys or your best mates is it really so our, our sound bite at the start of this show then that it was it was like morning of the earth all over again can, 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 can you imagine how those guys felt or is it still that kind of sense that like well you know this is you know it wasn't morning of the earth it was evening of the earth <laughs> well <laughs> The period I'm talking about is right in the middle of that, that, you know, the first couple of months when Indonesia went into lockdown and it was, hmm. yeah, it was, it was pretty tough, but things become more relaxed, you know, and beaches became open because Bali was closed completely. You know, the beaches were closed and it was similar in South Sumatra. You weren't really meant to be surfing. So it was, it was difficult, you know? Yeah. 
But I think by August, things started to open up and, you know, the beaches in Bali reopened. And from there, you know, things improved. And I did a couple of trips after that and had some amazing times, you know. So, oh, really? Yeah, Wait, I, I where did regret. you go? I did two trips. Um, I did one trip to G-Land in, in East Java. And that was with um, Eugene Tolomash and James Handy and another oh, yeah. friend, Nick. I don't know if you know them guys. They're from yeah, Cornwall. Well, yeah, Eugene works. He's a chef, isn't he, on one of the boats in the Mentoes? Yeah, he's run a boat for a long time, and he's been a, a great influence up here, and he's helped me out a load. So yeah. he, he invited me on the trip with, with uh, James and the other boys. And, yeah, we had an amazing time over there, you know, to get G-Land with, with just a handful of guys. Was, it was an amazing experience, you know. What, what is I was a handful actually, of guys at G-Land? There was, there was 12 guys there in total. 12 so, guys. Yeah, and, I mean, you're talking, <laughs> yeah, it was pretty prime conditions, uh, so yeah, that that was an amazing, amazing trip, and great to hang with Eugene. He's such such a nice guy. For the uh, for the benefit that, of the listener, later, Rob and I, I are completely trip. pale here. <laughs> I did another trip with Eugene, and uh, we went up to the the Banyak Islands, which was actually closed at the time. It was uh, it was a full mission on a fishing boat, and we stayed feral up there. And a guy called Macala Jones and his friend Todd came with us, and that was probably the the pinnacle of the whole year, you know, we had some amazing waves up there. And again, I was shooting most of it. I was taking photographs, but um, yeah, them times, I'll, I'll never forget them times. It makes it worth it, them hardships. Yeah, it's times like them, amazing. Is Indonesia um, and its surf like a, a little bit of an addiction? Um, you know, would, would you find it now difficult to adjust um, if you did make a decision that you were going to, you know, like, can can you get out for a Welsh surf? Or do you come home and, you, you know, or I say home, do you come to Wales and you think to yourself, like, this is cool because, you know, it's freezing and I'm in a wetsuit and it's like two foot and it's sloppy and it's a different type of surfing and it's kind of, it offsets against Indonesia or or, or is there the very real risk? I mean, I've, I've met guys in Indonesia who live in Kulangata and they talk about how like oh I don't go surfing at home because it's onshore and cold and crowded and like you know and and so so does it sort of is there a point of no return where like that becomes your idea of good surf and and it, and it, it, you can't go back? Yeah, it's, it's funny you say this, Tom. The boys come to Bali. You know, we got friends here now, and there's always crew coming from Wales, and I don't surf that much in Bali, and they think I'm crazy, you know, because I get spoiled on a boat and these trips and. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll, I'll never i'll never stop you know if i come back to wales I'll, I'll be in the surf for sure it's all about catching up with the boys and having a bit of banter and you know for, for, for me surfing is all about that that adventure you know wherever it's driving the boat into the middle of nowhere and looking for new waves in the mental eyes or whether it's getting up at four o'clock in the morning freezing cold everyone jumping in the van and going to try and score some waves in west wales that's what it's all about isn't it so you you you're hankering still for a Back, back door in a freezing section at Broadhaven South. Then, oh, I'd love, I'd love oh, a go at Broadhaven now. I love that way. <laughs> so much fun. Here, it's been busy recently, though. There's a lot of, lot of crowd problems there. Founded in 2010, Obsessive Disorder has maintained its identity as an independent UK surf company designing and supplying quality surfing hardware. Following years of testing and used by surfers up and down the country, what they offer are products of the highest standard that provide maximum durability and performance in the water. Deck grips, leashes, fins, wax and clothing. Check them out at obsessive-disorder.com. A message from OD there. And on that note, you may have remembered that OD part-powered our survey monkey at the end of season one with a prize draw promised if you left your details. Well, it now gives me great pleasure to announce a listener who filled out the questionnaire has won themselves a goodie bag from OD, and that person is... Uh, drum roll, producer Dodd. One, two, three, <laughs> oh. All right, OK, give it some welly, yeah. Uh, Duncan Agleton. Congrats, Duncan. Uh, we'll be in touch with how to claim your prize. Anyway, uh, our guest is still here and we've got one little last bit to do. Amazing stuff, Luke. Uh, thanks for the insight into your world. It's been a pleasure. Uh, we have one more thing to ask about before we do wind down. As you all know, 2021 still has uncertain prospects for travel. And so all over again, to insulate ourselves against the possible risk of not being able to go anywhere for a while longer uh, yet. Are we going to do surf travel nightmares again, are we? You bet we are. 
And we have one that we've been saving for, for quite some time for this special occasion, talking to um, the, our Welsh expert, our man on the ground in Bali. This is a tale straight uh, from the island of the gods. Are you going to tell us who this one's from then, Rob? This, Tom, um, is from Anonymous. Oh, them again. For good reason. <laughs> for good reason, I suspect. Dear Crestcast, back in the heady days of the mid noughties I struck out on my first trip to Bali. I'd watched the surf films, seen the mags consumed every detail of any surf travel guide that I could find online. I was excited beyond belief and arrived on the island full of optimism, hope and naivety. I was there to surf and, in an attempt to cut accommodation costs, ended up renting a room with some Australians I had met whilst trying to wrangle a lift from the airport in Denpasar. They briefed me on the do's and don'ts of Bali, what to drink, where to drink, a few morsels of local lingo, and most importantly, for this story, they told me that rather frequently local law enforcement officials would pull tourists over for absolutely anything and expect a small bribe for their troubles. I took it all on board and embarked on a night out in the infamous Kuta. Well, needless to say, I had a lovely night full of bounty cocktails and bintangs, and... I was fortunate enough to meet a very lovely young English lady who had recently graduated as a doctor. Conversation turned to dancing and dancing turned to kissing. <laughs> Above the thundering bass filled music, the lovely young lady asked whether I would like to accompany her back to her hotel. Not wanting to appear rude, I of course obliged and soon <laughs> enough we had swiftly exited the club and hailed a passing scooter taxi driver. She climbed aboard behind the driver and I behind her. Holding on tight, we sped off into the humid Indonesian night. That's <laughs> where it gets good. I'm, I'm laughing. So, yeah. I know. It's, 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 it's a good one. <laughs> after a few minutes, it gets better. After a few minutes on the scooter, I noticed flashing lights ahead, a whirring siren, and our driver slowing down. We were being pulled over. Gathering all of my wits and trying desperately to remember how much my newfound Australian friends had advised me to tip the police. I clambered off the scooter and attempted to retrieve my wallet from my board shorts. Not just any board shorts, Hurley Phantom four-way stretch board shorts. Noticing this, the police officer approached me but stopped short. He looked worried and threw his arms in the air, mimicking someone being held up in a heist. I, fresh on the island and naive beyond all measure, stood still, perplexed. It was then that I realized that the police officer was in fact having a good old joke at my expense. The punchline, my advanced state of arousal. You see, the bumpy journey over potholed roads in close proximity to a very lovely lady had, it seems, been enough to leave me in an advanced state of turgidity. <laughs> <laughs> the Hurley Phantom four-way stretch board shorts were at capacity, <laughs> breaking point. Pin taut like a snare drum, a high top, a mainsail in a squall. These were the most advanced board shorts ever, so had said the Surf Dome website. Damn advancements in board short technology. Stay in your lane, Nike. Quit interfering with surf gear. At that moment, I'd have taken the saggy elastic waistbands and rashes of yesteryear for anything. But alas, there I was, beneath the flickering streetlight with nowhere to hide my modesty. <laughs> I can still feel the hot rush of embarrassment in my face. I can still see the hysterical faces of the police officers gleefully pointing out my pronounced anatomy, resolutely steadfast behind mille mere millimetres of space-age fabric. My lady friend trying desperately to control her laughter for what I assume was the sake of my dignity. I shudder at the thought, though, as it turns out, so pleased were the policemen with their five minutes of fun that they deemed it sufficient enough to pass through their checkpoint without a fine. <laughs> and there we have it. More a tale of embarrassment rather than nightmare, but hopefully it'll provide some light relief to you and your listeners. Keep up the good work. Well. Anonymous. <laughs> anonymous. Quite a, quite, quite a letter. I don't know about you. I was, I was there. I was on the, the streets of Kuta <laughs> when I read that. I could see the flickering streetlight. I could see the police officers. Goodness me. How was that one? That's that gold. Thriller. That is it. That the bar has been set. Oh, sorry. Excuse the horrible pun. The bar has been set very high. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 
Very good. Um, yeah. Luke, you, uh, I'm sure you, you heard a few of the, the surf travel nightmares from last year. Like Tom said, uh, the, uh, we've opened our account early on with uh, a, pretty, a pretty solid tale. Again, no pun intended. Luke, do you have any uh, nightmare stories of yourself from uh, your own travels? Oh, yeah. So many, Rob. <laughs> Tom actually asked me <laughs> to have a think about this. And uh, yeah, it's just uh, they're never ending. But um, I mean, on the boat, when we're doing the charters, we, we always, every year, we'll have some nightmare, you know, whether, whether it's getting caught in really bad weather and engine failure or whether we've had a very serious injury and we've got to get the guy out of there. Um, but all the surf trips, I've always seemed to get good waves, you know. Um, one, one thing that does stick in my mind from the times as a Grom was a trip I did down to France with Lloyd Cull. We did a, a trip down in his van. We were going to go down and stay with Carwin. And uh, I remember I met, I met Lloyd in Swansea and off we went. Uh, we got across the ferry and we had a couple of beers and I remember driving down. We, we had a, we had a pretty bad car crash and okay. uh, well, a long story short, we, we got held in a police station for a while and yeah, Lloyd was in a bit of trouble, but we, we managed to get out of there a day or two later and Lloyd's old man come and picked us up and yeah, back to Wales we went. <laughs> oh no, that is a nightmare. <laughs> so that was one of the first trips, you know, that we didn't actually even get any waves. So that's probably uh, probably one of my worst trips I've done. Short and sweet story. <laughs> that's a, it's it's job done though. It's Luke. done its job. <laughs> yeah, that's a, yeah, that that's put us where we need to be, hasn't it, Rob? That's it. Well, the whole the whole purpose is to kind of put us off from from missing travel and to to temper our our kind of our itchy feet yeah yeah we yeah. we didn't think we'd still be traipsing out this mantra in 2021 but here we are who misses surf trips not us stuff just goes wrong anyway doesn't it and listeners we are indeed on the lookout for any more that you have as last year the email is castcrest at gmail.com and you can also contact us through instagram uh, and do give Luke a follow on Instagram as well. It's uh, at Photoboss Bali. Um, yeah, and we uh, also have a Twitter account, which producer Dodd is uh, eagerly getting registered uh, at the moment as we speak in order to plug the void left on that site by the banning of the outgoing US president. So, yeah, I reiterate, Luke, thanks uh, so much for joining us on today's show. It's been, uh, it's been a pleasure. And, dear listener, if you've enjoyed Luke's tale... Uh, and haven't done so already, then do please subscribe to us on any of the ma many platforms from which our episodes can be downloaded. These include Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and YouTube. We'd also be eternally grateful for a review if you have the time to. In a fortnight, season two will continue with quite a guest, the show's first Olympic medalist. Can't believe I just said that, but you did hear me right the first time. Our next guest is the professional snowboarder, an all-round ripper and purveyor of Stoke, Jenny Jones, whose airborne antics at the 2014 Sochi Winter Olympics were nothing short of an inspiration. If you've seen videos from the wave, you'll know Jenny is also a fantastic surfer and to hear her talk about that passion is quite something. She'll be chatting to Rhino Thomas and myself about all things surf and snow, including her own Olympic experiences and her views on what surfing can expect when it debuts in Tokyo this summer. Yes, this and some other fun tales from Jenny's wide repertoire of adventures in the next episode of Crest, in partnership with Elusive, available on your platform of choice on Monday the 29th. Until then... Thanks again for listening, one and all, and see you again soon. Diolch am grando a gwelach i'n vian bau. Cheers. See ya. Cheers, bye.